Even before we could fly, humans looked up with a burning desire to take to the skies. Our journey towards commercial aviation as we know it today can be traced back over 530 years. It began with Leonardo da Vinci's early flying machine sketches. Although they were never made, these imagined aircraft would mark the beginning of the incredible aviation firsts to come. These advances have relied upon constant engineering innovation, taking us quite literally to new heights and speeds. But like me, the aviation industry is now facing an existential crisis. After being ravaged by a pandemic and trying to exist in a world that's ever more climate conscious, can the aviation industry continue to innovate and become sustainable? Winging it. Now there's one part of this aviation innovation journey that's always bugged me because instead of moving forwards, it seems to move backwards. I'm talking about supersonic air travel. Why did it end? And is this beaut coming back? Concorde made the impossible possible. No, not buying a property in London as a millennial, but flying the rich and famous two and a half times the speed of sound in utter luxury around the world. At a price, of course. In today's money, a seat like this would set you back about £4,000. One way. Ouch. Excuse me, can I have a little top up, thanks? After a turbulent 27 years of service, it was announced that Concorde would be retired in October 2003. Captain Mike Bannister was the chief pilot of the British Airways Concorde fleet. He clocked up just under 10,000 flight hours on Concorde, almost 7,000 of which were supersonic, which is more than any other pilot in the world. So here it is, the only Concorde simulator in the world. What do you think? It's glorious. Oh, Mike, beautiful, isn't it? And now I'm going to pop you in the seat so that you get to fly it. Aim to go through Tower Bridge. What, under us? Yep. We're going to lose our license, you know well, that. Well, yeah, I'll take the blame. Excellent, well done, Rio. <laughs> I have control. Just take You have control of your aircraft. Do you remember the first time that you got to have the real Concorde, not the simulator, at your fingertips? What Absolutely. Like? We've done the training, two months in the school, two months on the simulator. This is the first time it's with a, a training captain sitting where you are. And he says, right, Mike, I'd like you to take off, climb straight ahead, level off at 2,500 feet. I thought, oh, that's easy. I'm an experienced pilot. I can do that. And he's smiling. I'm thinking, why? Open up the engine to full power. The airplane's at lightweight. Down the runway. My word, the next thing I know, I'm at 4,000 feet. <laughs> and he's sitting there with a big smile on his face. And some of the performance we could get, we'd use full power for takeoff. We could take off from Miami, say, and be at Mach 2 within 15 minutes. Wow. I mean, a really, really fast performing airplane. We called her the rocket. What do you think was the real downfall of Concorde? Why did she have to be retired? It's rather like that perfect storm. Things came together. Fundamentally, the cost, the cost of operating her, the cost of maintaining her, uh, the fact that she was expensive to run and the, the amount of income was no longer as strong as it had been. Do you think the environmental impact of Concorde, we've got to be honest, she was a gas guzzler. Did that impact how she was retired? She was a gas guzzler in the sense she used a lot of fuel, but because she's traveling so quickly, she actually used less fuel going to New York than a 747 of her day. With the current environmental situation, yes, she would probably be beyond her time. But the next generation of airplanes, the ones that can bring in new modern technologies, modern techniques, flying supersonically is definitely on the cards again. Do you think we need it? The human race has never gone backwards for very long. The human race likes advance. People want to travel quicker. They want the experience of flying on the edge of space where the sky got dark, where you could see the curvature of the Earth. And I think all of these things are coming together to make it possible again now. It just demonstrates how far in advance Concorde was. But my daughter's a pilot, a commercial pilot, and I look forward to the day when she's flying a supersonic airline, just like her old dad did. We could just be a few years away from reclaiming that dream. Meet Boom Supersonic. Founded in 2014 and with $270 million of investor funding behind them, Boone plans to build and launch a net zero carbon supersonic airliner by 2029. 
Their flagship aircraft, Overture, will be capable of reaching speeds of up to Mach 1.7, cruising at an eye-watering 60,000 feet and powered by 100% sustainable aviation fuel. Each Overture airplane will cost a staggering $200 million, but operators are already lining up to show interest, with United Airlines kicking things off with 15 aircraft on order and an option for a further 35. Interestingly, the deal hinged on a commitment for Overture to operate at net zero carbon. Flying supersonic and protecting the planet sounds too good to be true. Well, the answer lies in these everyday waste items because what they have in common is their ability to create something I mentioned earlier, sustainable aviation fuel or SAF. When you think about sustainable aviation fuel, it's a category of fuels that pulls carbon out of the air and uses that to produce the fuel, which is then burned on the aircraft. The technology that Boom is most excited about is something called power to liquid. This uses renewable energy to pull carbon from the air, combine that carbon with hydrogen, and then uses that to power our aircraft. And, and you can see in that case how you really close the carbon loop and for every pound of, of carbon you emit, you've pulled another pound out using renewable energy. That is so cool, isn't it? But is it possible for the current global commercial aircraft fleet to just switch over from traditional Jet A1 fuel to SAF? Do, do any changes need to happen inside the aircraft? Yeah, so SAF isn't quite chemically identical to fossil-based fuels. So currently it's limited to a 50% blend, 50% SAF, 50% Jet A, which is a great starting point, but it's not where we want to get to. There's two avenues to get up to being able to use pure SAF. One is to make uh, the SAF chemically identical to fossil-derived jet fuels. This includes adding some environmentally damaging chemicals called aromatics um, to make sure that they're compatible. Because we're designing a brand new aircraft, we can design the fuel system and, and the engine to use different materials that don't need those aromatics and enable us to truly use 100% uh, sustainable aviation fuels. So it's not just about the fuel, is it? I mean, what are the other advantages of building this aircraft absolutely from scratch when it comes to making supersonic flights sustainable? Because it's a brand new aircraft, we have the opportunity to select the most sustainable materials from the wing materials to the seats um, to make sure that it is truly a sustainable product. We're also able to think about aircraft recycling from the start, even though we won't be recycling the first aircraft in, for another 30 years, um, we can build those provisions in now. It's not just chemical pollution that creates an environmental challenge for supersonic aviation, but noise pollution too, as rich people laugh at you from above. No, but seriously, Concorde was known to startle the communities it flew over and even smash windows of skyscrapers as the famous sonic boom reverberated from the aircraft down to ground level. Now NASA and aircraft manufacturer Lockheed Martin are trying to find ways to lessen the intensity of the boom enough to allow supersonic flight above populated areas. But what exactly causes the sonic boom in the first place? So when an airplane's flying in, uh, through the air, it's pushing disturbances in front of it. As you go faster and faster, you're kind of catching up to those waves and they can only go uh, Mach 1 supersonic. So when the airplane gets to a supersonic speed, those waves that you're pushing in front of the airplane can no longer get out of the way, essentially. And so what happens is it just makes a big step pressure increase and that's the shock wave. As that propagates down to the ground and it goes by your ears, you get that sudden change of pressure from that shock wave and that sounds like a boom or an explosion. So how are you planning to quieten the boom down? So what, what we're doing with the design of the airplane is we're trying to spread out the shock. So there's a shock anywhere where there's a pressure disturbance on the airplane, there'll be shocks. So we try to make it as smooth as possible to, to reduce the number of those. But the other thing that we want to do is keep all of those little shocks, those little pressure waves from coalescing to be either in the front or the back of the airplane. So we've designed the airplane so that the, the volume distribution increases and then decreases as smoothly as possible. We've uh, designed the aerodynamics so that the uh, pressure distribution is even, and all of those things go into keeping those pressure disturbances separated uh, as they propagate to the ground. It takes longer for that pressure change to cross you. It'll sound like, you know, 
closing a car door instead of an explosion. So if your design is successful, could this mean that we could see the next generation of supersonic planes flying over populated areas? That's a big part of the project, is to uh, fly this airplane over several different communities and, uh, and, and get community response to, uh, to demonstrate the acceptability of, of flying supersonically over these uh, uh, different types of communities and different geographies to eventually allow you know, overland supersonic flight. We may be years away from sipping champagne as we fly faster than a rifle bullet and high enough to see the curvature of the earth, but we are hurtling in the right direction. Who knew that the return of supersonic air travel could be the unlikely saviour of an aviation industry that's battling to survive in an ever more climate conscious world? I mean, that's just brilliant. If you'd like to see more of Winging It on BBC Real, then hit subscribe and tell us in the comments.